Right, so annoyingly, I am going to have to make videos about Bo the Fifth Column, Justin King, again. Because uh, what do you know? He's doing pro Israeli, pro Biden imperialist propaganda when it comes to the Gaza conflict, the bombing of Gaza. It's not. Uh, anyway, um, so I mean, I would be uh, happy to let a YouTuber whose actual job it is cover this, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. So I'm going to have to do it. I was going to do like one long video talking about all the videos he's made or well a lot of videos that he's made since uh, the bombing in Gaza started but um, unfortunately I mean I really like I mean for one thing I was looking at it all yesterday that was easily going to be in a one and a half hour video and uh, since I am never going to edit um, that's quite an awkward thing to do. I do actually have to have it fairly well organized and practice and stuff and it's it's just really like that that's going to be awkward and um yeah uh filming in daylight's awkward i have to mess around a lot with lights bring all the lamps in so you can actually see me it's real annoying so um yeah i'm actually i kind of felt like there was a video that came out today which i'm gonna touch on um later which um kind of made me realize that this is an ongoing thing it's going to carry on he's going to keep making more videos which is going to i'm going to feel like i have to say something about so i may as well just break it up into um uh, smaller chunks basically so um yeah so today i'm going to talk about this video i'm going to touch on this video that he made initially um before the uh bombing started i think and then this one that he that he released today um so there are specific subjects i want to talk about so like i said he's doing pro biden propaganda i don't know how long he's been doing this i i used to watch him a lot while trump was still going but there kind of came a point where i realized that i because i was watching all of his videos that he released daily like when I was sitting down to do my YouTube watching and I came to realise that, that yeah, there was a point where I wasn't really, I couldn't remember what he was saying after I'd watched them and I just thought there's no point in me actually sitting and watching these videos. So um, for quite a long time, certainly since Biden's been in, I've really just had his videos playing in the background for the most part and like only made a point of watching like some specific videos about a topic I'm particularly interested in. So I don't really know how if he's been doing pro Biden propaganda from the start, but he's definitely doing it in this context, and it's very concerning. Another thing that I really want to talk about is his anti-Iran propaganda, which I'm very concerned about. Now, I am not a supporter of the Iranian government, okay? I'm really not. Uh, solidarity with people of Iran, generally, of course, but, you know, I'm not a fan of the Iranian government, but... I find the way that he talks about Iran very concerning. I find the fact that he makes a point of talking about Iran so much a bit strange considering it doesn't come up much on Twitter. It doesn't come up much in the mainstream media in this context, OK? Um, yeah, in the context of the bombing of Gaza. It's, it's like, obviously it does come up, but not in a way that he talks about it. And that's kind of interesting to me and concerning the way that he talks about it. Another thing I really want to talk about is the specific words he uses and the specific words he chooses not to use. And I'm going to make a really, it's actually changed, so one, I'm going to kind of make a point of showing you the difference between what he said here today in this video three weeks ago and in this video that he's uh, made today. Um, and about specific wording that he uses and the words he chooses not to use and why that's concerning but I am going to make a whole video about it. Now um, I think so one thing I really want to quickly touch on is um, this one thing um, that he says here which I think is a really important indicator of how he's um, basically doing imperialist propaganda. So here we go. It is there, there is some reporting suggesting that locals in Gaza have told the civilians not to move, 
and that it was a trick. We'll see what they believe um, and what they do, or if local authority allows them to move. That there are a whole lot of variables here as to where this can go. Realistically, there aren't any good options. Okay, so I think it's really important to point out here, so this is him talking about the evacuation order when it was first issued by Israel, the Israeli government. Um, so he's making it very clear. Now, make, uh, make a note here, he's not mentioning the word Hamas. He's very clearly talking about them, but he's not mentioning the word Hamas. But he's also very clearly saying Hamas might be... Hamas are giving them propaganda about how it's a trick for them that, to tell them to move. Actually, it's turned out that, you know, this was three weeks ago. So actually, it's turned out that people who have tried moving to the south from the north have been bombed on their way there. They've been bombed when they've got there. So if Hamas did tell them it was a trick, maybe they had a point, okay? And I think another thing to, and like, okay, so he's been very careful to say local authorities. So he's not trying to say they're simply a terrorist group. He is kind of acknowledging that Hamas are in charge. Um, but how much he'll acknowledge that they're like, you know, in charge of making sure the hospitals are run and the roads are working, stuff like that. I don't know how much he'll concentrate on that rather over the fact that people like to say that they're simply a terrorist organisation. Um, okay, so I think it's very important. Yeah, so it's very important to note here. He is trying to say that Hamas are basically holding the citizens of Gaza, Gaza hostage, the Palestinians hostage. That's what he is trying to say here. That is a pro-imperialist talking point. I think it's very interesting that he's trying to avoid using the word Hamas. He doesn't want you to think about who Hamas really are. He doesn't want you to think of Hamas specifically. Um, he's very, it's very interesting the way that he talks about this and the way that the words that he chooses to use. So um, this is a video that I kind of wanted to look at because um, he's talking about why, he's trying to explain why um, Biden has given his full-throated support to the bombing of Gaza, but also trying to say, but it's a very strange explanation, and I think completely, it sort of almost proves the point that nobody in power cares. Um, I'll let you watch it. Actually, that, that was what they were going to do. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, the very first tweet from the Secretary of State was one that was echoing Turkey's call for a ceasefire. And then news broke about the captives. That tweet was deleted. And it was replaced with, Israel has the right to defend itself, rescue any hostages, and protect its citizens. The uh, Office of Palestinian Affairs, they actually had a tweet up and it was their position, the, the, the route they were going was to say, hey, no retaliatory strikes, everybody chill out, come to the table, talk. News of the captives broke. That tweet was deleted. And it was I feel like I should have checked what the Office of Palestinian Affairs was, uh, where this department is, because I don't think they're the people in charge in, jo in Gaza. Um, anyway. Replaced with one that unequivocally condemned the attack. There was a formula when it comes to the, the cycle that's over there. And yeah, under normal circumstances, the Palestinian side could absolutely count on the U.S. to try to broker a, a ceasefire or to call for restraint that that's the normal formula. Now I think something I really want to point to here is he's using the word ceasefire here. He's using it here three weeks ago just after this all blew up he's using the word ceasefire. Remember that. Yeah, yeah sure. 
However, once captives were taken from a whole bunch of different countries, many of them U.S. allies, that wasn't going to happen. We talked about this early on. Um, a non-state actor taking a U.S. citizen, that, that changes the formula for the U.S., for State Department. Um, because then it's no longer about trying to calm everything down, trying to pursue diplomacy through that route. It's about getting people back and nothing else. Um, so he's basically saying that what's been happening since, the bombing of Gaza that has been happening since, the reason that Biden has been so, yeah, go for it, go for the whole go do what you want is because there are US citizens who are being held captive in Gaza by Hamas. So these US citizens are being bombed in Gaza alongside their captors and Israeli citizens And this is somehow a good reason to keep bombing. I, and this is the thing, this is what, it's such a bizarre explanation that he's giving here because he's not at any point later saying they're gonna have to stop the bombing. He's not really. He keeps talking about the IDF invasion, the ground invasion and how that shouldn't happen, but he never really says they shouldn't stop the bombing. He knows, he's saying here, there are US citizens being held captive in Gaza. They're being subjected to the bombing as much as everybody else. I mean, there's possibility they're safer because they're being held in tunnels with Hamas or something. But um, it's just, it's so bizarre that he, what he's trying to tell us here is that it's somehow better and okay that, um, you know, we're going full on into this, into this bombing of Gaza because there are US citizens being held captive there. It's unbelievable. And this, of course, has been the same line that's being peddled by Netanyahu because they need to do all this bombing because they, they need to get the captives back when they know that they're killing the captives alongside, with the, alongside Hamas. It's ridiculous. And I, oh. That's what happened. There's a lot of people who have very extreme opinions when it comes to stuff like this. Just understand, those opinions don't exist in a vacuum. And what sounds good ideologically, when it hits that table and the news breaks, it changes opinions. Yes, if, if this had been limited to military targets, let's start there. The U.S. absolutely would have been calling for restraint. Now, I've got to say, I don't believe the U.S. ever really would have called for restraint. I'm sorry, but I really don't. Why would they call restraint on military targets? What happened? And the fact that there were Americans lost and Americans captive, the U.S. is not going to call for restraint there. Um, it's one of those things where I, I would imagine the U.S. would kind of look the other way on just about anything right now. And there you have it. He is really saying that basically Gaza and probably, you know, he's not got to talking about the ground invasion yet but anything the IDF do it's fine including frankly let's face it killing US captives they can do what they want the United States has never been super effective at pursuing Palestinian interests. But oftentimes, 
they did call for restraint. And sometimes they actually got it. That's what happened. Okay, so another thing that I'm going to talk about is um, his tendency to try to say that Israel holds all the cards, Biden's just like a restraining influence and they've got no influence over Israel at all. He keeps saying that. And this is part of that. That's part of his whole thing, really. I know a lot of people aren't going to like that answer, but this question came in repeatedly. Why, where is State Department at? State Department started to do what they always do. And then they found out they took U.S. people captive. And it changed, it changed the formula. Um, so that's the question. That's the answer. Uh, they had a false start on it. I mean, they started off doing what they always do. But as more information came out and news of the captives came out, it changed everything. Now, I feel like it's also very disingenuous for him to keep saying, oh, well, they always call for restraint. The US always calls for restraint. The US State Department always calls for restraint. No, they don't. They're well known for not being restrained. I just find this whole thing extremely disingenuous. And unfortunately, his audience are really lapping this up. Now, um, it's going to talk about this video that he's just released. This says 14 hours ago now. Um, so I think it's really, now I mentioned him not using the word ceasefire earlier, or using the word ceasefire. He used it there. Now look at him talking about it now. Appears when you say the same thing to them because sometimes the rhetoric that gets used on social media is not actually something that resonates with your local politician or your representative up in DC. We're gonna do this because I got a message. And basically it was, hey, I called my representative and told them that if they didn't support a particular measure and call for a certain thing that I wasn't going to vote for them. And I could tell in their voice they just did not care what I was saying. So look at that. This person who sent him a message was actually saying they wanted a ceasefire. He is really, really avoiding using the word ceasefire. Um, I think it's really important to note that this is what's happening here because the reason he doesn't use that word is that he's trying to avoid it being in your head too much. Like he understands very well what words put stuff, what what puts things into your heads. Okay, so he understands that if he uses the word ceasefire now, people are going to think more about a ceasefire. But because he's avoiding actually using the word, even while he's talking about it, that kind of hides it a bit. It kind of makes it less upfront and people are thinking about less about actual ceasefire. I think it's very important to notice this. Okay. Now what I find, one of the things I find particularly disgusting about this to be quite honest is what he then goes on to compare calling for a ceasefire to. Ted Cruz. I do not think that's my place. So I can't do that. But I can talk to you about the way you phrased something and why that hardline rhetoric that you see on social media doesn't actually translate well when you're talking to your representative. So you are the representative. You're in office. I'm calling you. And I say, hey, you have to support cloning dinosaurs or I'm not going to vote for you. Now, there are a lot of analogies here he could have used. I don't know, he could have talked about how they want to clone wolves, for example. He's quite a big fan of wolves, right? 
clone wolves to bring back populations of wolves, okay? He could have mentioned that. No, he didn't. He mentioned cloning dinosaurs. And so this is somehow a reasonable analogy to asking for a ceasefire. That's disgusting. He's kind of made, you know, he's avoided mentioning the word ceasefire and now he's try, basically trying to say that asking for a ceasefire is as ridiculous, it's like asking to clone dinosaurs? Who the hell really genuinely wants clones dinosaurs? Who really cares that much about it? But he's trying to basically tell you that the idea that asking for a ceasefire, asking for your representative to support a ceasefire in Gaza, asking for your representative to support stopping bombing thousands of people in Gaza to death is somehow equivalent to bringing back dinosaurs. That's disgusting. He's such a, oh, he's horrible. Now, I find his explanation for why you shouldn't do this a little bit um, disingenuous, kind of unhelpful, let's say. Seeing that vote go into the book about general sentiment. That phrasing, it sounds good on social media and it motivates people. I'm definitely not saying to not use it on social media. But when you're actually talking to the representative, it is self-defeating because you render yourself irrelevant. Does that mean that there's nothing you can do to shape the opinion of your betters? The person that is supposed to be representing your... Right. So a couple of things here. Now he's trying to say that it's irrelevant to ring your representative and talk to them about a ceasefire because you need to have lots of people who agree with you about this, okay? And, um, like, you know, the idea that people want a ceasefire is a bit of an out there uh, idea in the U good old US of A. They're all for continuing to bomb Gaza, to bomb citizens of Palestine. Well, well I mean, they're not really citizens, are they? That's the problem. But, you know, he's... It, oh, and also, do you not notice there that he said he referred to these representatives as your betters? He just slipped that in. A little, little bit of a little slight twist there, you know, little, little suggestion. He is totally telling you that you are not as good as those representatives. He is telling you that you don't know or you don't, they're, you're not relevant to these people. Interest, how do you get them to do it? You have to appeal to their self-interest. They're people. They're people who sought out positions of power. Odds are self-interest is uh, a big part of their personality. How does uh, Trump keep the Republican Party in line? If somebody speaks out against him, does he say, don't vote Republican? Don't vote Republican, vote Libertarian. Does he say that? No, of course not. How does he keep them in line? Other Republicans do this as well. If they don't support the right positions, what should happen to them? Well, they are rhinos, and they need to be primaried. That gets a politician's attention way more than I'm not going to vote for you. They need to be primaried because they're the incumbent. They're in office. That's why you're calling them, right? They might be able to skate by without a primary at all, which means they have more money to use in the general to maintain their position to fulfill their self-interest. But if you say, I represent this group of people, and if you don't support the things that we support, we may have to launch a candidate that does support those things in the primary. 
You, you get way more, way more consideration that way because you're appealing to their self-interest. Okay, now, so basically what he's saying is it's pointless calling a representative. Find some way of stand, either stand as a candidate for, in the next election against them or find someone who will and support them. Run a whole campaign. Get someone in at the next election. That's appalling. And he acknowledges that that's an extremely hard thing to do. And also, how long is it till the next representative's election or the senator's elections? Um, I mean, was it 23? I, I mean, I don't know exactly how it works. I'm not hearing much about uh, upcoming elections. Uh, so, ugh. I think, and also, you know, I mean, it's November, for God's sake. We'd, we'd be having them right now if there were going to be any. So he's basically saying, wait till the next election to worry about, to try and do anything about the bombings in Gaza that are happening right fucking now. That's what he's saying. Or he's saying, tell them that you're going to get your people together to do that. And got to be honest with you, let's face it, they're going to laugh at that. Representatives aren't going to care about what. There aren't many people who can run alternative candidates. There aren't many alternatives to Democrats and Republicans that manage to get in. And that's what he's telling you to do. And he acknowledges that it's really hard. But he says, that's the only path that is possible to you. Don't bother calling your senator. Don't bother calling your representative, asking them for a ceasefire. And he kind of tries to say it's a minority view for, to ask for a ceasefire. Um, it's appalling absolutely appalling um is it i think it's here actually just, uh... the, that you do want to vote for that does align with what you want it, it's more work because you have to find somebody willing to run and then you have to actually back them but if you do that it is far more effective. More importantly, if you do that and they win and they get up there, when you call them and you say, hey, you need to reevaluate your position here or we may have to run another candidate, they're going to know you will do it. Yeah, so that, that, that's his answer. This is a guy who claims to be an anarchist, by the way. I mean, he never actually uses the word. Absolutely appalling. Really, really appalling. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything interesting in the comments today. So, um, yeah, that's it for today. I will try and um, do fairly regular videos. I will do those sort of specific subjects in the future. I hope I'll try and do it like twice a week or at least once a week. Um, so yeah, next time.